our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. It's been a slow Monday as everyone tries to cope with springing forward an hour, but the Alabama legislature will return to action tomorrow. Lawmakers will resume their special session in which they are considering the last round of, of federal COVID relief funding and the paying back of the Alabama Trust Fund. Here's how the week is likely to break down time-wise. On Tuesday, the House will take up the ARPA funding bill on the floor, while the Senate takes up the Alabama Trust Fund repayment bill. Both are expected to be passed and transmitted to the other chamber for a first reading. Then on Wednesday, a Senate committee will take up the ARPA funds, while a House committee takes up the trust fund repayment. And finally, on Thursday, both bills are expected to pass their second chamber and to be sent to the governor for her signature. Just like Schoolhouse Rock. House Speaker Nathaniel Ledbetter said he did not see any reason why the House wouldn't pass their bill in short order. Yeah, I feel like everything's going well, and uh, the you know the learning process that we've given to the members, I think they know where we're at and what we need to do. Uh, I suspect that we'll sit on our floor on Tuesday and maybe on the Senate floor by Thursday. That's my hope. Do you hope that the House members have a better understanding about the opera funds, what it can be used for, what it cannot be used for? Oh, yeah, I think there's no question about that. I and mean, we've spent many, many, many hours, and uh, we have been in great detail. And, you know, the people from the budget process, uh, along with the uh, you know, we've got information from the Treasury to make sure we use the money right, and certain our people, Kirk Fulford here, that's uh, that kind of runs the show as far as our numbers, are, he does a great job, and he's given us all the information we need. Director Poole has been with us every step of the way, and the executive branch, so I'm, I feel good about where we're at. Some have asked why lawmakers and the governor adhered so closely to the use of money going to hospitals, nursing homes, water and sewer infrastructure, and broadband internet. Senate General Fund Budget Chairman Greg Albritton explained that the rules around the rules around this second round of money did not allow for revenue replacement funds, which is how they were able to spend about four hundred million dollars on new prison construction the last round. The guidelines have not changed that much, if at all. All right. Uh, the difference is that last year we had the lost uh, revenue. Uh, uh, calculation that was in that was allowed wherein the state was able to make a calculation based on the formula the feds gave us as to how much of that one billion dollars could be considered lost revenue to the state that's where that money came from and with that that was considered uh, straight revenue to the state without the guidelines okay and so we had a lot more opportunity to do many things this year we do not have that there is no lost revenue calculation. All the money be subject to the guidelines, and that's where the more restrictive aspect comes in. With the special session taking us through Thursday, that means the regular session won't resume for another week on March 21st. And we also won't get a detailed look at the governor's budgets until then either. That's because the Constitution requires the governor to submit her budgets on the second day of the regular session which hasn't happened yet. Finance Director Bill Poole did brief lawmakers on what they could expect to see more broadly from the governor's education budget. Capital projects targeting uh, particular K-12 needs in higher education. Again, looking for one-time investments, preferably deferred maintenance, although uh, that's not an absolute statement. Um, number of statewide economic workforce type development projects you know, we heard and know very well, we have a lot more jobs than we have people to fill them. And we've got to get more people trained and ready in the workforce. That's a constant theme uh, across all of our efforts, particularly in, in terms of education investments. We'll be right back with tonight's guests. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Joining me next is Cam Ward, Director of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles. Cam, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Thanks for having me back, Todd. Well, plenty to talk about in your uh, realm of state government. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to ask you about was this big 
controversy that was uh, a little more than a month ago uh, with the, the release of inmates early. The legislature passed a law uh, requiring that inmates who were set to be released anyway got out early with the stipulation that they be monitored electronically. Um, this is where your agency comes in. Yeah. What, what can you tell us about what happened? Well, the legislature passed a law in 2021 and then roughly 18 months later required both Department of Corrections and us to implement it. So far to date, I think you've had 513 people that were released. That means they actually had, they were within 12 months of completing their sentence. And then 12 months, once they call EOS, you end a sentence, then the state of Alabama no longer has any jurisdiction over you whatsoever. They're released within that 12 month period. We're required to elect electronically monitor and provide them some pretty intensive supervision as to what they do every day. Mm -hmm. So far, they've had 513 come out. I think we had a total of 35 of them are already off their monitors because they EOS, they're done. They've completed their sentence to the state of Alabama and we have no more jurisdiction. And then out of the 513, 4% have actually committed a new offense, which we put them back in prison for. Almost all the new offenses were roughly drug related, some sort of drug possession, drug use problem. Mm -hmm. I think it was 21 out of the 513 that we've had to send back to prison. I see. And I know it wasn't your bill, wasn't your law, uh, but talk to me about the what was talked about when it was passed. It, it was the virtue that, like you said, end of sentence, that's when you walk out of the jail, walk out of the prison, yeah. and, and, you know, good luck. Was the idea for this to be, okay, let's monitor those who are set to be released in order to reduce recidivism in some way? Federal data, typically the DOJ, FBI data shows that if you have some sort of supervision in between your incarceration and the time that you're finally just walking free, that there's a better chance of you not committing a new crime. So when you say it's 10 years and you get out in nine months or nine years and three months and you've got you know nine months to go, nine months you're on supervision, that gives you time to kind of reintegrate, making sure they're, they got a home plan, they're getting the drug treatment they need, whatever's needed before they end a sentence. Because once you reach the end of that 10 year period, you walk out the door and we have no authority to supervise you or drug treat you or anything. That's That was kind of the thinking I think the legislature came up with in 2021 when they passed this. They asked us though, they said, if we give you the tools to the electronic monitoring, would that help keep up with these folks to make sure they stay you know, on the straight and narrow? And the answer is absolutely yes, it does. That, that electronic monitoring, which we monitor everybody who came out on mandatory release under that 2021 act, we, uh, we have found that tool has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, there were, of course, a lot of headlines and, you know, a lot of politics. When you say, hey, all these prisoners are getting out sure. of jail all at one time. And a time. rifle concern. A lot of There's a rifle concern because when you hear that, you go, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a, a big crisis. So I, I get the concern, mm -hmm. but I can tell you we were given the funds to do it, and I think we've done a good job so far monitoring everybody who was passed under that law. I remember when the representative from the uh, Department of Corrections was before the legislature kind of during all this and they kept saying they had a real uh, problem with victim notification because that's part of the law too yeah. right you must notify mm -hmm. the victim's family is that one of the lessons that we've taken away from this past couple of months and this law well first of all I think we have a broken victims notification system anyway that's no one's fault it just we can do a better job and that because so for example right now if I'm granted regular parole the Bureau of Pardon and Parole is re required to give you notification to the victims or victim's family. Under the mandatory supervision law that was passed in 2021, Department of Corrections has to give notification. In addition to all that... This is two different agencies. And then you have a separate database altogether over to LEA that was passed several years ago. You really need a unified victim's notification system. And that's a long-term project, but I would agree that that is that's part that, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. And DOC was correct in saying, "Whoa, we kind of got stuck with this part. We, we weren't prepared for this." And pardon parole's like, "Well, okay, but we do it over here, but not with you." There's got to be a unified system so that all of us are working from one database and one system, not this hodgepodge that's been created over the years. We can, I think, that's an area we could definitely do better long-term. That makes a lot of sense. I wonder if we might see legislation to that effect. Let me switch gears real quick because um, I know that 
You've, one of your big priorities recently is the parole reentry education program. You call it PREP. Correct. It's all about re reducing recidivism. You don't want these folks back in prison. That means getting them on the right path. Tell me about PREP and how it's going so far. So one of the biggest missions we have in our agency is we basically deal with people with either once they've been paroled or once they've been sent to probation, either before incarceration or after incarceration. We deal with you once you're not incarcerated. And what do you want? Well, I don't want them to hurt somebody. I don't want them to commit a crime or go back to prison. So what we've invested heavily in is the prep center, which is located in Uniontown, Alabama. The, it was a vacated prison that was around forever. Uh, the state gave us the money to purchase that site. We purchased it and you are using it as a residential transition facility for people who are no longer in prison, but they were previously incarcerated. We're putting them in there, intensive drug treatment, mental health treatment on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what's going on. Plus, we have a job training program. What we have found is that in our current job training programs, if you go through that job training and you successfully complete the program and you complete the mental health and drug treatment program, the recidivism rate goes from 30%, which is the regular rate statewide, to 4%. They just, they don't go back wow. to prison. And you have some of these people who were previously incarcerated, they're getting out, they're now getting certificates of work. They're starting off jobs making over 50, 60. One of them may start off making over $85,000 a year and they're clean and free of drugs. And the private sector, we've had 15 private sector employees, employers contact us saying, we want some of your people to come work for us. Will you help us? So that pri public-private partnership has allowed us to really, I think it's gonna make a long-term dent in recidivism. If we can get them back to work, we can get them clean and we can get them help for their mental illness, they just don't go back. So I think that's a big part of our mission and something we're gonna continue pursuing ahead with. So is this, is this voluntary? Do you show up voluntarily or is this something no, this as is a part, part of, of your, your terms, sentence? Either part of your probation or part of your parole. But so far we've seen a great success at it. I think you'll see it ramped up even more because we realize the benefit it's providing. But also I think you'll see this happening more and more around the entire state. We have 11 day reporting centers the prep center being our 12th one. I could see us easily at some point doubling that number. My goal is by the year 2030, we see recidivism go down Alabama from 30% to 15%. If we did that, we would go from 25th in the country as far as recidivism to somewhere in the top five best in the country. And I think we can do that if we continue investing in programs like the legislature has here. Well, those numbers alone, I mean, what, what you said, 30% to, would you say four? four? Yeah, that's. That's pretty. That's the data a, backs it up. Yeah. You just, but you have to invest the resources, and you really have to be mission focused on it. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking mm -hmm. of resources, um, you presented your budget proposal about this time last week to the legislature. Look, you were one of many state agencies that said you're still getting feeling the effects of inflation, and especially gas prices, because your uh, parole officers do a lot of driving. Yeah, so we have roughly 800 employees in our agency, but about 630 are pure law enforcement. They're in the field every day. They're out working, they're going to check on people, making sure they're complying with probation and parole terms. That means they have gas, the gas issues, are, and the gas issues constantly with that inflationary number on gas prices really chewed into our budget. Now, I think we've managed it in a way where we've timed it right, we've kind of moved some people around to cover shortfalls, but at the end of the day, gas prices are gonna to continue to impact agencies like Pardon Parole, it's gonna impact agencies like DHR, uh, impact agencies like ALEA who are out, they have officers out in the field, but they, be, they have to drive somewhere, sometimes long distances to accomplish their goals. And if the gas prices continue going up again, it's gonna it's gonna eat into our budgets. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, so suddenly those those budget surpluses we were looking at maybe not so much with all these new expenses. Yeah, with inflation, um, you have financial instability in the markets. The, the budgets, even though that surplus looks good, I think with with the ARPA money and the federal stimulus we've seen, I don't think you can sustain that. Yeah. I think you're going to see a pro I think the legislature is being wise and looking at, you know, they want some relief, tax relief. Um, that they want some issues like that, but I think you've got to be careful to make sure, you know, these law enforcement officers in the field, the gas prices are going to dictate how much they can keep up with the people they're supposed to supervise. Well, yeah, because if a recession does come and budgets do start getting cut, it's agencies on the general fund side that generally see those It's always cuts. a general fund side, although I do think, and I think there's some legislators who would agree with me on this, um, 
I think what you will see is I think the ETF could also take a big hit because your sales and income tax sure. always go first. But yes, on the general fund side, the biggest issue that will hit agencies like mine, Alia, and DHR are the gas prices. If the gas prices go up a lot, what does that mean? You park cars. If you park cars, people aren't out seeing people, monitoring people who need to be monitored and watched more co- carefully for public safety reasons. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the budgets have a real world impact. We're out of time, but. Cam Ward, Director of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Todd. We'll be right back. (music) Joining me next are Colonel Ryan Richardson, Commander of the 42nd Air Base Wing, and Chief Master Sergeant Lee Hoover, the Command Chief. Uh, of Mexico Air Force Base here in Montgomery. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on Capital Journal. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you for having thank us. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to have you on for to talk about this Operation Welcome Home. It's a re- really special series of events you have uh, here on base in Montgomery. But first, uh, for each of you, I hope you might indulge us and tell me a little bit about more of what your role is here at Maxwell. Colonel, I'll start with you. Sure. No, that's a, that's a fair question. We do get it when we're around town a little bit. Uh, so the 42nd Air Base Wing is responsible to manage Maxwell Gunner as a power projection platform for the United States Air Force and the United States Space Force. So one way to think of it is we run everything on base. I think maybe the mayor is a good uh, is a good analogy. I think in the <laughs> conversation we generally get down to that point. But we've got 42 mission partners that serve on the installation. Air University, Lieutenant General Tullis and team, um, we're there to provide provide uh, combat support, information warfare, and combat medics uh, to make sure all of our mission partners have what they need on Maxwell Gunner. So uh, again, in the 42nd Air Base Wing, our role is to lead the installation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and so as the command chief, I work alongside Colonel Richardson. I'm his uh, senior enlisted leader. Uh, you know, so in the military, uh, certainly in the Air Force, 80-something percent of our uniformed active duty airmen are enlisted. And so my job is to make sure that they're ready, that they're trained, they have the, they have the tools, the education, the um, wherewithal the esprit de corps necessary to make sure we accomplish that mission effectively every single day when we wake up. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that's a role and uh, I'm proud to do it along this side, this guy. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Well, you've got a special event coming up, Operation Welcome Home. Walk me through the origins of this event and what the community has been a part of uh, here in Montgomery. Yeah, so this marks the 50th anniversary uh, to the end of the Vietnam conflict. It also marks the 50th anniversary of Operation Homecoming, which was the repatriation of prisoners of war from that conflict. Maxwell Air Force Base actually served as one of 10 Air Force installations that re- and was involved in the repatriation of prisoners of war. 43, in fact, from 14 February uh, 73 to the 1st of April were repatriated here. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for us to, to say thank you to Vietnam veterans. Uh, to remember and acknowledge the sacrifices of so many and as we kind of talked about before the show you know chief and I have served just north of 20 years and you know when we come back from those opportunities to serve our country you know you get the 10% off at Lowe's you get the free beverage or the free meal with you and your family and I I would just offer that I don't think that many of our Vietnam vets receive the same so this is an opportunity for us to recognize that sacrifice and say thank you. As you mentioned 50 years and, and aren't there a series of events that have been going on and, and still yet some upcoming? There are. Uh, we kicked it off on the 14th of February. We had a panel of three former prisoners of war. All three had been repatriated uh, at Maxwell Air Force Base. That's an online event that's available for viewing. Uh, on the 12th of March, just this Sunday, we had the Traveling Vietnam War Memorial, along with a number of other memorials that are kind of encompassed in this in this truck, arrive in the River Region. They stopped in Prattville, and we had a Rolling Thunder escort of uh, nearly 40 motorcycles, most of whom were Vietnam veterans and first responders that escorted it onto the installation. Uh, it was installed yesterday, and this morning we had a kickoff uh, event for a 24-hour relay race where we will keep a POW, prisoner of war, missing an action flag in perpetual motion for 24 hours. Um, it was an amazing opportunity to hear from a number of patriots, uh, not the least of which was Colonel, uh, Captain Retired Lee Robinson, who was the longest held enlisted uh, airman 
as a prisoner, uh, some some north of 2,700 days in captivity. So we got wow. to meet he and his wife this morning. Um, that will then transition into tomorrow. We'll end the 24-hour relay. We've got about 600 children from the river region, uh, grades 7 through 12, that will come to the wall. And we'll walk them through that, um, that process tomorrow afternoon. And then really for the public uh, on Wednesday at 0800, uh, at Kelly Street Gate, the Air Force Base will be open to anyone in the community and any Vietnam or otherwise a, a veteran writ, writ large to come and be recognized on the installation. So uh, we can talk a little bit more about the specific times, but uh, this is an opportunity for us to open up the installation to the community within which we serve. Uh, we're blessed to raise our families and, uh, and really in this, at this point say thank you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you know the, the, those images from prisoners of war being flown back, getting off the airplanes. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking of you know APT did a documentary on Jeremiah Denton uh, and all of what his career uh, meant. Um, but but those images are searing mm -hmm. of of getting you know blinking torture and getting off the airplane. And it was documentaries like that. You know I didn't know the Jeremiah Denton story until it was you know, on TV basically. So this seems like a great opportunity hearing from these these men who were prisoners of war directly from them of what their story was. That's almost a once in a lifetime opportunity, I have to think. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh it's inspiring for the airmen and uh, all the service members that are there at Maxwell Gunter. Um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. It's 50 year anniversary, right? And uh, and as Colonel Richardson said, we certainly our experience in the military is different from their experience. Uh, it's also the 50th anniversary from the uh, the um, the uh, volunteer force, right? When the Selective Service went away in 1973 at the end of Vietnam War. So all of us who are serving today, we volunteered, right? We raised our right hand. We said, hey, this is what I want to do with my life. And mm. and many of the service members who are listed on the wall that we now have at our on our base for the next few days, and certainly many of the, many of the Vietnam veterans that are coming in and out of the base over the next couple of days, uh, it wasn't a choice for them. Um, a completely different experience. And um, certainly as far as prisoners of war, uh, none of us who are wearing the uniform, uh, maybe a handful of airmen over the last 30 years have been prisoners of war. Uh, but not the same experience that they've gone through for sure. And, uh, and you're right, we can't forget that. Um, and, and how dare we ever forget that. And so that's why we are um, putting on this week to just uh, not only ensure that we never forget them, but to make sure that we honor them appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, uh, the emotion is palpable, right? Many have had the opportunity to go see the wall in Washington, D.C. This gives an opportunity for many Americans mm -hmm. who've not had that opportunity yet to view the, the 58,000 names of those who perished during that conflict. Um, so when you think about that coupled with the over 81,000 that are still unaccounted for, and you think about the associated family members, um, it's hard not to get emotional about it, to be honest. Sure. So we're, we're, we're hopeful and thankful that we can share that with the community. Absolutely. When you mentioned the young people, uh, the, you know, from junior high to high school and, and what have you, being a part of that, you know, when I, sometimes when I talk to veterans, they mention that in terms of Look, I, I don't need a ceremony. I don't necessarily need a medal, but I don't want people to forget. Mm -hmm. You know, don't want people to forget their um, fellow veterans, those who, you know, fell, those who got left behind. It, so it seems like this is a special coordinated effort to make sure that doesn't happen, we, that we don't forget, that we keep their memories alive and the memory of, of their service and um, time as a prisoner of war uh, active in our memory. One of the things that, uh, you know, we have the 24-hour run today, and so we're going to keep the prisoner of war flag uh, moving around that track for uh, 24 hours. And at the same time, of the 81,600 uh, Americans who are currently missing in action, we're going to read every single one of their names. So every single one of their names are being read out loud at the track right now uh, over the next 24 hours um, for exactly that reason. Um, we, we can never forget them. We need to honor them appropriately, and, and part of that is just saying their name out loud. Um, so we have somebody signed up for the next 24 hours to make sure we do that. How about that? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Maxwell Air Force Base, Maxwell Gunner, is such a foundational part of this mm -hmm. community and the state, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, I just know, you know, from working in Congress, so much goes into the Maxwell Air Force Base. It's such a, a big deal. But, you know, not every, you know, an everyday member of the community may not be aware of everything going on at Maxwell. So is this... Uh, also a good opportunity to open up the gates and have members of the community come in and engage and, and see what all is going on at Maxwell? Yeah, it, it sure is. Um, it's been a number of years since we've opened up the installation to the community in a way that we are 
this week. Um, traditionally, that happens with an air show or an open house. Yeah. Which, by the way, we are going to crank one up <laughs> next April. I remember the uh, air shows when I was a kid. It was yeah. Awesome. So uh, the Blue Angels are coming to town, and we'll have uh, we'll have a lot of uh, air power in in the River Region come next April. But this is an opportunity for us uh, to not only say thank you, but to exercise some muscle groups in how we interact with the community. Um, inviting the community onto the installation such that they can appreciate and understand just a little bit more of what the Airmen Guardians and their families are going through on the installation. And, and it ought not just be that, that gate that they drive through or when they cross over the, the river on their, on their way to Prattville and go, I wonder what's going on over there. This is, this is their installation. Um, this is all of our installations. So we're going to work hard to do that, but uh, our one request, and we're working with local leaders here, is to help us figure out what we can do by, with, and through the community in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we happen to live here, we participate in sports and go to school and raise our children there, but but I think we can, and Chief and I have, have been talking about this with our leadership team, how can we earnestly be present in the community in a way that's meaningful? And, and whether that means helping build a home uh, or help clean up or be in schools and, and help where we can, um, there's a conversation that, that, that we need to, as we kind of step out of COVID and, and some of these other kind of uh, milestones uh, and just figure out how to be more present in the community and how to figure out how to get the community onto the installation more. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is a great one and I think you're going to have a, uh, I know you already have, but I know there are a lot of veterans and their families who are appreciative of, of just the effort. So thank you for what you're doing uh, and thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank Appreciate you. you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at 1030 with more coverage of the Alabama Legislature right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.